uh, applies to everything in life. It, it's, it's all, everything we do and think and are is determined, really, whether we know it or, or not, by what we believe about God. Now, that can be we don't believe in God, but it's still a belief system uh, as to whether God exists or not. Everything that we are goes back to that. So we want to cement a worldview in our mind that absolutely enthrones God um, and magnifies Him because without Him, we go back to chaos is what we do. It's, 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 as most of you probably discussed in your groups today, it's really the whole concept of evolution and the lack of God is, makes us all meaningless. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't see life that way. That's just not a reality. So um, our worldview, the way we see God... And Genesis, and this is what you, I will repeat a lot of what you did in your lesson, uh, probably, but I want you to know Genesis is a declaration of God. That's what Genesis is. It is not the history of man, although that's in there, but it is a declaration of the God of the universe. That's what it is. That's what Genesis 1 is. What I love about Genesis is that it, it gives us a story, but notice that whenever there's a story, we look for us in it. Yeah. That's the top priority. Where's, where am I? You know, what about me in the story? When, when really, that's, I really think why the first part of Genesis has nothing to do with us. <laughs> We're not even in it yet. Because it's really a declaration about who God is. And that is a worldview. We have to start our worldview right there. And we make our decisions regarding um, life and all that we do based on that reality. So, um, also I loved last week that when I saw the notes, went over Cherie's notes. Did you know that... Cherie numbered 14 different theological themes in the book of Genesis. That's just the one she named. Uh, there's more there when we'll get into them. As we have, but, but 14 theological themes in the book of Genesis. She also gave 12 identifications of the nature of God. Just a, 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 a quick overview of the identifications of the nature of God. 12 of them just in, in Genesis alone. Um, and that's before Jesus is ever in the picture. And we have a clear understanding, if we look at Genesis, of who God is. So it really is the basis of our worldview. Um, and I believe that creation, and I'm more convinced of that after coming back from where I was last week, is God's greatest evidence of himself. Creation is God's greatest evidence of himself. That is why, and you saw that in your lesson today, we went back and looked at some of the verses, and most of them had to do with the book of Job, right? Where God uses creation to declare who he is. And he uses it um, in, a, in a very interesting sense. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start right there um, and go from that. But, but let's pray before I move on. Father, I, I am so grateful for these women uh, I am grateful for the friendships, I'm grateful for the fellowship, I'm grateful for the hearts that are on fire here to know you, to walk with you, to serve you, to exalt your name. And we are privileged to be together here today, and I, I just thank you for this church, for the, their um, willingness to give us a place where this can happen, to where they encourage that, and they, they want us to be strong in your word and to know who you are. And they encourage that. And, and the women leaders, the men leaders, all of them, uh, their goal is to build us all up in our faith so that we really have a true understanding of who you are and can live our lives accordingly. So I'm grateful for all that you've offered here, for this, the comfort and the rooms that we have and, the, um, and just the, the beautiful circumstances they put us in to where we can actually do this here successfully. But none of this means anything unless you're present and, and you promise that you are. So we're going to claim that presence right now. We know you're present within us. You're present within your word. The power of your spirit wants us to know you. You want to reveal yourself. We have, we have everything necessary to, to walk away from this room today with a greater understanding of the God who created us all and a, and a closer walk with him because of that. Thank you for that privilege. Thank you that you've provided that for us today. And we're trusting, and I'm trusting, Truly, that you are, number one, going to speak through me. Number two, that we're all, you're going to meet every single one of us right at the point that we're at to encourage and strengthen our faith and our walk with you. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, when we look at um, Genesis uh, it, 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 and the declaration of God, there are numerous times, and I wanted to go into these, but I can't because I've already babbled on too long. Um, 
But I wanted to number, well, let's just really quick go to Job with me. Um, uh, and go to Job 38. And you all know the story of Job, where Job is like, what the heck is going on? I don't know what's happening here, but I don't know why I deserve all this, but God's doing something, and I just want some answers. Have any of you ever been in a place where you wanted answers from God? The wise. We talked about that in the group today. The wise. Well, that's what Job wanted. He wanted to know the why. And um, although I think if God had told him the why, I don't think he, he would have gotten it. Uh, anyway, but um, so we go through that whole book um, with his friend saying, the why is because you're just a bad guy. You did something bad. Um, and he's like, great, then tell me what it is. I'm willing to take that, but just God, tell me what it is. Because I've tried not to do those things. Uh, but I have. So, but, so then finally in Job uh, 38, God answers. And you know the story. This is an awesome story. But I just want us to identify why creation is so significant. Because I want you to see right here, um, immediately when, when, when God decides to answer Job, what he does is give him a whole story of creation. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think he gave, so he, he, he answers Job, and this is what he said, let's look at verse, um, uh, in Job uh, tw uh, 3, verse 4. Let's just start there. Where were you? Right? Where were you? This is, this is, this is Job being, uh, God responding to Job with his question of why. And Job, God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? He uses his act of creation to not to answer, and as we said in our group today, that's a rhetorical question, clearly, uh, because everybody knows where we were when he created the earth, right? We were nowhere. We were not even there yet. Um, and Job knows that as well. And he says, tell me if you have understanding. Jump down then to verse um, 16, and he says, have you entered into the springs of the sea, or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Notice again, a rhetorical question. And he's using his creation to make his point. He doesn't have to say, I did it all. He's just saying, did you? Did you do any of it? Were you there? Did you have know anything about it? Then look at verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? So have you even considered where all that comes from? Where the, the hydrological cycle? Do you know anything about that, Joe? Were you there when I kind of set that up? Because... Clearly, if you do have something to do, if you have something to do with creation, now you can question me about who I am. So if, when I ask you one of these questions, you finally go, oh, yeah, I, I was there. Then maybe we can have a discussion. But if you have, if none of these questions you can answer, I was a part of it, no, that's why I said God's creation is his greatest evidence of himself. And he uses it over and over again. Verse 31, he says, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you, verse 32, lead forth a constant, can you do any of this? Can you do any of the things of creation? These are just the simple things of creation. Um, can, can you handle any of that, Job? Verse 33 again, do you know the ordinances of the, of the heavens? Um, or fix the rule over the earth? Okay, Job, as soon as you can give me a yes answer, we will have a discussion. But until then... You should just look at my creation and shut up. <laughs> and what does Job do? I'm going to shut up, is what he says. That's exact. So we know, if you go to, um, I, I'd like to say I don't have time for this, Psalm 148, verses 1 through 13, Psalm 33, 6 through 9, Psalm 89, 6 9 through 9, and uh, verse 11, all of those, all are, are God answering his authority by, by stating his creation. His creation screams... God is what it does. It screams it. And he uses it over and over again to validate. Anytime somebody's going to question his authority, he will, met, he will most often use creation. Okay, let's talk about creation then and see if, because see, if there's anybody, anyone who can challenge or could do what God did at creation, now we've got a competition going on, right? But as long as God can say, is there anybody who can do what I just did? Okay, is there anybody, anywhere, any kind of God? And I thought that was quite fascinating. I'm going to be so late. Uh, that, uh, I forgot how much I like talking about this stuff. Uh, I've been on a cruise of two weeks for people who don't talk about this stuff. So it's like, okay. Um, at any anytime he starts talking about his creation, it is always a definite directive to his authority. It, it automatically gives his authority. So, 
Um, we, that's what I mean by creation is God's greatest evidence, and he uses it over and over and over again. So, when we live in a world that says creation now proves there is no God, we should be scared. <laughs> because if that is the proof where nobody can question, and, and, and that's why, and you notice that the gods that they usually created, do you remember when Paul went in and he was, he was addressing them on all the gods that they have in their city? Um, and he said, I said, these, he, these are great, but I'm going to tell you about the God who actually created all this. None of those gods claimed to create the whole thing. Some of them might say, I have control over the thunder, or I have control over fertility, or something. But none of them ever said, I did it all. That's why there had to be one for each thing. But so, so no other God has ever claimed to be the author of all creation. That is a claim that nobody can trump. Um, and, and that's why it declares who he is. So chapter 1 of Genesis is so huge because of that that um, I want to go back and reiterate some things that I saw uh, in that chapter. And some of that, as I said, is, is stated in your, in your questions, but we want to just reiterate that. So I'm going to start there from Genesis 1.1 and um, restate that, that just the beginning phrases... In the beginning, God created. Now, what I what we first see from this is, is the statement that you're going to fill in right there. God is not being defined or defended. No, God, in the beginning, God created. He's not giving any explanation of who God is. He's not giving any um, evidence of his authority to do that. He's not doing anything like that. So he's not defining himself and he's not defending himself to prove that he did it. He is assumed and revealed through the what, why, and how that he creates. I love this when I saw this. Because he just said, it just says, and God created, and then it goes on to tell what he created, and that creation defines him. It defines, it defines his authority, it defines his sovereignty, it defines his power. All of those things are now defined because of what he's doing. He doesn't have to say, well, let's, let me show you my credentials. No, he said, let me show you what I do. And then if somebody can, can buck up against that, great, we'll have it. But nobody can. That's, that's the whole thing. Nobody else. And that word create, the, the word create, that bara that we talked, I think I mentioned that in the lessons. Um, that word is only used in reference to God. There is another, there, it's, there's other words for other people creating things. But this word created is only in reference to God. Only God can create what God created. Yeah, thank you. Old ladies knows this round. Um, so there you go. Um, thanks, honey. Uh, and that's that. That's the reality of, of what he's trying to say here: is that he created Bara. He is the only one who can do what was done here. Now I'm going to throw in some things, just some thoughts that I've had about this, and you're just going to go. Okay, that's okay. That's you get used to it. Um, <laughs> so. So just that first statement, in the beginning God created, is not a defense. It is a declaration. It is not a defense of God or an explanation of God. It is a declaration of God. So here I go. Here I'm going to show you who I am by what I do right now. And then it says, and the earth was formless and void. This is, this is a very interesting statement. Um, and, and of course that number one right there is God is revealed in creation. So he's starting out with what it was, formless and void. And he's saying, now watch me. Watch me. Watch what I do here, and what I do is going to show you who I am. Now, this is very, very important to us because we, because our faith is based on believing things about God that, that are not always visible, right? They're invisible things. And we're going to talk about some of that today, but uh, if I can get that far. <laughs> we'll see. I, 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 I'm so excited about this. This, this is the coolest thing. So, he's revealed in his creation, so, and that's what he's doing. Here I am. I'm going to start doing stuff, and I'm going to show you who I am by what I do. So the first thing is he is eternal. Notice that it says, in the beginning, God. So he was already there. He didn't, somebody, and, and clearly if he's going to create, and nobody else can even create what he creates, nobody created him. Because if they could create him, they could create what he's about to create, right? So, that, so that's, a, that's a, when somebody says, who created God, that's a... That's a ludicrous statement. That's an irrational statement. Because God assumes he is eternal by this statement right here, by what he says right here. He was already there. Anything created from this point 
is, is only because God was not created. That's the only reason we can even have creation. So, uh, God is eternal. He was present at the beginning. He is all-powerful. Obviously, these are some of the things that Shri brought out last week. He has the power to do what no one else ever will or can possibly be or do. These are all decisions, ladies, that we have to, we have to, we have to cement in our head because of our own lives. Um, and that was one of the questions on your thing is, what does it mean to me that God is these things? And this is the point. It is a declaration of, of God. I believe all of you are here because you believe in God. But what do you believe about him is what's important. And that declaration of what we, he says about himself is what solidifies our faith day after day after day. Because see, if, this, if we believe this is true about him, we have no reason to not trust him. We, we can not trust people. We cannot trust circumstances. We cannot trust the world because there's sin in the world. But as far as God is concerned, there is no more solid rock than this right here. People fail. Circumstances are horrible. Sin devours and destroys. But God is a different entity altogether. And that's why we put our faith in him. So this is a faith issue that we have. That's why this is a biblical worldview. So... He is all-powerful, and this is something I want us to notice, that I noticed. Um, his spoken word makes what is spiritual. This is what I want us to know here. I, I want us to really see this. Remember, in the beginning, God, he's a spiritual being. He's not tangible. And I just thought this was so interesting that now God, the intangible God, wants to make things tangible. He wants to give structure and um, Reality, or, or I should say that because he is reality, he is just taking his own reality that is spirit and giving it something material. material. Exactly, good, good point there. So um, he is taking what is spiritual and intangible, he is making it, into what is physical and tangible. I want you to think about that for a minute. So God who is spiritual, and that's what that, those first verses are saying, the earth was formless, the void darkness was over the surface of the deep, something was there, right? But it wasn't a tangible thing. It was a spiritual thing that is not that has no substance to it as far as being touchable or material, as Susan said. Um, so this is what he wants. Now, seriously, we've got to think about that. What in it, it? What in God, who is perfect and all that He is in His state as a spirit? What causes Him to all of a sudden want to make things tangible? What? Why would He want now to put physical realities that that are that are I'm going to use the word sensible, and I'm going to have to explain it to you. It means, uh, it means explorable or observed by your senses. Do you know what I mean? Do you notice that we, are, we observe our world, we explore our world through our senses because the world is tangible? It wasn't when he started. What would cause him to want to make tangibleness when there was, he's in a perfect state? Why did he bring it to be tangible? Why did he want physical? An interesting thought. I have no answer for that, by the way, if you were waiting for one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so he makes it uh, to physical and tangible. Formless, when he says that, means to be in disorder and void. Void means to be empty and undistinguishable. So what that means is that, this, I want you to think about that. It's a spiritual reality, a, a, a spiritual thing. Now, it's not bad because of the fact that it's without order. And when we, because we think of when we say, that it is, um, it is in disorder, we think bad. No, it just means it's not formed into something structured and usable yet to anything other than spirit. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, so that's what he's doing. So when it says that, that word, that's what that word means. So um, formless means to be in disorder, and void means to be empty and undistinguishable. Therefore, God brought substance, structure, and purpose, that's your blank, to that which was disorderly and unproductive. So, he said, now, we know it isn't bad because it's with God. It's just not, it's not being used for the purpose that he wants it to be intended for. So, that's what those words mean. When he takes away the void, uh, when, he, when, he, when, he, um, uh, when he takes away that formlessness and the void and he makes it, it's because he has a purpose. He wants to do something with it that is different than he has done before. It doesn't mean it's bad, it's just that now he's going to create it to do, to have a goal, to have a purpose in why he's structuring it. So he's going to structure it for that purpose. And, and we have to, I, I really seriously want you to go, 
I, I want you to, to think that through. How many zippers did you have? <laughs> but I haven't been able to talk to you people in a long time. This is exciting. These things have been rattling around in my head for a long time. Now I'm <laughs> you guys are so gracious to talk to this. So, um, so anyway, so the, the formless is to be a, it's disorder and void needs to be, to be empty and undistinguishable. Therefore, God brought substance. So now, we know that one of God's purposes in taking the intangible to the tangible is he wants to create order and design. That's what he wants to do. He wants to take what is not useful right there, other than in the spirit, whatever, he's, whatever is over the surface of the waters right there, or the deep, and he wants to make it usable by tangible means, by, by physical means. There is no physical person here yet. There is no, and, and you know what? He has no need for this in himself, right? He has no need for physical. So what is in God's mind already as he's doing this? What? Us? Exactly. Exactly. He's all, he is creating from day one. He is simply creating tangibleness because he's going to put creatures in there that are both spirit and, and body. They're both, they're both of those are going together to explore him in that way. So he's revealing himself in those kinds of things. So order and design. Notice, I want you to notice some of the things he does now when he does that. He creates light and separates it from darkness and separates water from sky and land. What is that? What's he doing there? About, exactly. He's organizing. Exactly. It's kind of like when you, when you go into your room and you know that there's a mess or you start putting things where they belong, where they're useful, right? Um, I mean, how many times have you guys said, do those clothes really belong on the floor? Um, because that's not useful. That's not purposeful. That's not where they belong. That carpet, we didn't buy carpet because it's a place to put dirty clothes. That was not the purpose of the carpet or the floor, whatever it is. So the purpose for the dirty clothes was what? The dirty clothes basket, right? So that it can go in the wash machine. That's the purpose. And we, do you see how much we know that in our world? Everything we have has purpose. We, we have and do has purpose and design. I really think. God did a better job of, of really identifying that with women than he did men. Do we get purpose and design? Absolutely. And order? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We get that. Because what happens when there's disorder? Things don't function well, right? You can't do what you were intended to do. Why am I washing clean clothes again? Because you did not separate them from the dirty clothes. Okay, that's... This is the same kind of thing. God is saying, I have a purpose for what I'm doing here. I'm going to make things physical, and now I'm going to separate them because I have a plan for them. I have a purpose in them being this way. One thing I do want you to notice here, which is just my um, weirdness, uh, uh, and being on a cruise, I noticed this. It doesn't say he created water. It doesn't say that. It says he created light. It doesn't say he created water. It says he separated the water. I don't know what that means. I just know that he, he did. I always thought he created it. But it doesn't say that. It says he separated the waters. Um, another thing is that he, if you'll notice, he didn't, he didn't create darkness. He just separated it from the light. So that was something different too. That's not a created thing. Darkness is not created. It is just an absence of light. That's all it is because he separated that from there. Um, anyway, those are, that's not even on. <laughs> Uh, so, number two, he cre noticed again the orderliness. Now that he's created, he separated the light and the darkness, he separates the water from the sky, and he creates the land, and he brings the land up out of the water. Okay, what do you think he's going to do with that? He's going, to, he's going to do something with it, isn't it? This is all for a purpose. So he does that. Then he creates plants to produce seed on dry ground. Plants need dry ground to produce seed. So that's why the dry ground came out of the water. Um, and then he does birds to reproduce in the sky, birds in the sky, animals to reproduce on the land, and wa the, the water, uh, to sea light to produce water, I probably skipped a thing there, but the, the one before that, he creates plants and produce seed on the dry ground and celestial bodies to encourage that productivity. Notice that that's exactly why we have the sun, the moon, and the stars, so that there's day, because he's already created light, right? But he's created a cycle, a, a life cycle. Everything for him is purposeful. I'm sorry, if you, am, I'm, you got those? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
But what, and, and you're like, okay, we know this. I, I'm only saying this because I want this to, to see this in the light of God's nature. God's nature is to create productivity and order and purpose. That's what, that's who he is. That is who he is. Which means that that is who we are, doesn't it? That's who he is because, and that means that's who we are. That's what was intended to happen here. So, and you can see it in that order of creation. You can just see him. If God could think like we do, he's thinking, okay, I, I, these people I'm going to create, I want them to be able to touch things. I want them to be able to see things. I want them to be able to taste things. I want them to be able to do this. So I'm going to create tangible things that are going to produce what they're going to love. This is one thing, I, uh, one problem that I have with, um, with evolution is it, you know, you go on a cruise and you're out in the middle of the ocean or you're in Alaska and, and all those people, a big percentage of those people there are not believers, yet they're all completely in awe. In awe. I mean, it is seriously visceral. It is like an internal response to this creation. Why is that? Why is that? Why do we respond? If this is just, you know, freak accidents, and it should, know, it should look no different to us than dirty laundry. It should look the same. It's like, yeah, big deal. No, we literally physically respond to beauty and, and the beauty in God's creation especially. So that, that's kind of a, that's why I want us to see this. What he's doing, it, it tells us who he is. It tells us who he is. He is not a God of disorder. He is not a God who is random. He is a God who is purposeful and intentional, and he's that way in our lives as well. This is all going to come to a point, I promise. Um, this week? No. No, no, no. That's still the two years. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so the next one is, you can see the other part of him, you can see his diversity. I love this part that I saw. Diversity and consistency unite. Uh, uh, because look at... How, look at how, how many things that are consistently the same. Uh, I mean, when you when really seriously, when you spend two weeks watching people like I did, we're pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. You know, we pretty much do the same thing. Uh, as I said, people go on cruises for four things. To do what they want to do, to be waited on, really. To eat as much food as they want to eat. To be able to have sex. And it's like all the same because we're on a cruise, that's what we do. Except for me. Uh, <laughs> Everybody and they 
breed more salmon, and they, they, they feed the bears, and they feed the ground, and they fertilize, they fertilize everything that they use with it. And so they're the, they're the life cycle. And they can see that. They can see that that's what it does. But they don't attribute that to, to the fact that God is an orderly God, and he, he uses things purposefully. They don't go up that ladder just to die, just because they're committing suicide. No, it's because he designed them to do a certain thing for a certain purpose, and it does benefit the earth. I believe everything that God did and created would benefit the earth if we were using it correctly. Yeah, I do. I think he meant that. He meant that to be the case. We do abuse it. We do misuse it. But he's still in control of it. He, he, we can't do anything beyond what he's doing. So it requires unity. And, and that's what I'm saying. When we take that idea of just looking at his creation and seeing that unity is a definite and cooperation amongst uh, uh, I mean, even when you look at the food chain, that's, that's unity and cooperation. They all need each other. And the, even the seasons, the seasons have to happen in order for us to do what we do. Um, I think that that should tell us, no wonder God wants unity in the body of Christ. He, his intention from the very beginning is that everything he makes works together. Everything is dependent on everything else because he's a God of order. And unity is a, and cooperation is the reality of that. That's why the church is told, to be unified, to be one. That's why marriages, you're told to be one. That's another one. Uh, <laughs> okay, the next thing it shows then is God's authority is relegated to man and woman. This is very interesting to me because notice that God can't be challenged in his authority in any way, shape, or form. His authority is top authority. But he goes through all of this, Genesis chapter 1, and it will be in chapter 2, and then he turns it over. To whom? To man. And, and then notice that the way he created man is way different than the way he created the animals. Did he just speak and man came to be? No. No, he actually took what he'd already made, put his spirit into it, and said, this is going to be something different. And so there we have, again, purpose and order defined. It's, he's defining who he is just by all that he's doing there. Um, so, his authority is now relegated to man, and that's where it says, he tells them in those verses, and I've got verses for all of these that, that separate, I'm really just going along chapter 1 um, in the way that it's written. Um, that's why he says, go and have dominion to them, because he's giving them authority. So, he goes from spirit to physical, and the intangible to the tangible, and now God will reveal himself through the avenue of the physical. He is now going to reveal himself through the avenue of the physical. He is always, he's always spirit, God is spirit, but he wants to reveal himself <coughs> through the physical, through tangibleness. And as I was mentioning in um, our class today, in the group today, it is, it is frightening to me, and I think I just mentioned it a minute ago, that we now take the very thing God gave to declare who he is and said it declares he isn't. Wow. We, we got to get toward the end, right? When that happens, there has to be something that's going on there. And that's, that's a problem. So anyway, he, um, and then, so he'll reveal himself now through the avenue of the physical, through the physical senses. Uh, touch, taste, smell, uh, hearing, all those things. Now everything that God is, that we can experience, we experience through that physical. Um, so that I, I, I'm just so I can't wait to ask him. Why did you do? Why did you do that? Why did you choose to do that? Uh, why did you choose to give us those things to experience you? And then now I want you to to think. Why did Jesus come in the flesh? Because God said you're going to experience me in the physical, as well as the spiritual. I'm going to give you both. So the endorphins are going off with that baby there. We're all yeah. Um, <laughs> um, he, that's, I love that. Uh, okay, so uh, he creates man and woman in his image to be a physical representation of himself over creation. So God has created purposefully and intentionally, and he created man separately, and now man is going to do, is going to model what God does over the whole universe. Man is going to model that and represent that in his tangible creation. That's who we are now. Um, his representation. Now, let me, off, off note here, if, yeah, I know I should. <laughs> Brad is going, oh, are you sure you're going to do that? Off note, it's not good right now. <laughs> uh, I got to not, because we have ways to go. No, we just, I'm almost there. Cool. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, and now I forgot what I was going to say. Because that's a good thing. So you keep it on. Um, uh, he is to be a physical representation of we are to be, he, we are the physical representation of him over his creation. And, and then that recreates now a responsibility for man. That is why God took the tangible and created man, breathed his life in him, because he was going to give him a responsibility that he doesn't give to the rest of creation. They have been given um, this, the, the image of God for leadership. And now to take control over what God has created. Why does he want us to experience him like that? What do you think? But can you see that when sin comes to the world, how the physical gets screwed up? See, that's what happened. Sin came into the world, and now the physical is screwed up. And how awesome it'll be in heaven. When it's not. Exactly. It will not be anymore. Um, but for some reason, this is how God wanted to express himself. Uh, don't know, but it, it's something that I, I need to I need to realize that everything every time some kind of crisis happens in my life, and I go back and realize, wait a minute, if God can create order and has a purpose and a design for everything, then I'm I'm part of that. He's got a purpose and a design and a reason for me and for my circumstances, and I'm representing Him in the midst of this. So part of our response to evil does represent Him. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? When we respond correctly to evil, we reflect who God is. That's why it's so important that we respond correctly. So, man's responsibility. We now have a responsibility that's different than all of the rest of creation. All creation was made with the intention of giving man rule over it. God creates man for the purpose of dominion. That's He wants him to, be, to dominate. And notice that he gives him a consciousness that no other created thing has. We have intelligence. We have sometimes we have understanding. We have the ability to relate to other people. We have we have um, the ability to have to know right and wrong, and and we have motives. We have discernment. We have all that none of the none of the rest of the creation has. Um, and that's what it takes to have dominion. You have to have those things to have dominion. But again, it ha it's there because we recognize that God had a purpose and intention for us in this whole process. He's not just randomly putting stuff out there. He is purposeful and designing it and intentional, and he wants something from it. Right? You don't create something unless you want it to produce something. Notice that everything he created, it produced something, didn't it? It brought about something. What do you think man is supposed to bring about? Glory to God. Yeah, that's right. That's what we will produce. That's why he said, you're my representation here. You're going to show my glory by your dominion over the earth. Well, we screwed that one up totally. Okay. Uh, fortunately, he made a plan for that even. And seriously, he already made a plan. He already had an intentional, purposeful design of taking care of the fact that we screw up everything we touch. So, see how smart he is? So, um, that, that's good too. So, Man's responsibility now is to live within the design, the order, and purpose that God established in his creation. That's what we are intended to do. So the next one is what happens when man rejects God's purpose and his design? What happens? What do you think happens? What? Hopelessness. Absolutely. Because see, our purpose... Is, is, is to be reflecting him, the representation of him. So when we don't go according to the design, and when he, when he had a design for us as people, and we don't live according to that design, there, there's nothing good that can come from it. That's like putting the dirty clothes on the floor. That's not what they meant. They were meant to be only it has a worse, uh, you know, the repercussions are way worse. So any time we act outside of the purpose and intention and design and orderliness that God gave us as human beings, chaos follows. Now dysfunction is going to come from that. And what is the main disruptor of that? Sin. That's it. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 3, aren't we? We're now going to see how sin is going to come in and disrupt the intentional process that God made for all creation. But see, what we want to do here is we want to look at our lives every day and say, in what ways am I disrupting that reality? By the things I say, by the things I do, by the things I choose, am I? 
a legitimate representation of what God intended me as a woman to be? Am I working that out in my life? That's why we're here. That's why worldview is so important because you can't know who you are and why you should, what you should do, and why you should do it, unless we we have the biblical worldview that God created us or designed. So when we get into the the, to, the chapter two and chapter three, and we see we start to see God's design for people, and we start to see how we now do we no longer we start to buck against that design. Why there is problems? Why that increases the sin? This is the story of God. This is what he's doing. This is identification of who he is. And it, without Genesis 1, we know nothing about who we are. Because we don't know anything about the creator who made us. Um, so, order. Um, out of chaos. Purposefulness. Intentionalness. Creativity. Diversity. And yet, we're the same. Unity is a necessity. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful to see you so clearly in Genesis chapter 1 and all the rest of the book. And that's what I want us to do. I want us to put looking at us and just be in awe of you. And when we do that, we are self-defined. By looking at you, we are now defined. And we find who we are. And we find identity. And we find purpose. And we find direction. I pray, Father, that that's what you will do. You will open our eyes in a new way to, to who you are so that we know who we are and that we can reflect you well. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.